Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Convocation Spring 2017. I want to say that it's absolutely a delight to see you all back again. It's been lonely here a little bit. Although we've been busy, but we've missed you. And I hope you all had a wonderful, restful break and ready to get, and you're geared up for the spring semester, which will very likely go very quickly. And before we know it, it'll be summertime, hopefully, huh? Not that we want to get the semester you know, quickly, but we want the warm weather back. Um, it's absolutely my pleasure to uh, kick off this morning um, with words from President Diane Call. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see many folks, most of whom I've seen in January doing lots of work. I want to thank um, all the staff, the faculty, the EM team for all the work that was done uh, since early November to get us ready for the spring term. And on the bright side, I suppose, after next week, we'll only have 14 weeks left to the term, which is kind of amazing. We're still uh, registering some students, so many of our colleagues on the uh, advising staff, et cetera, are still working very hard to finish up. I'd like to welcome, we have some new faculty, wonderful faculty, Catherine Griffin in art and design, and uh, Dr. Punita Bach, Bach, I'm gonna say it wrong, Bahab Saku, and in biology, Professor Carmen Reed in nursing, Professor Gabriel uh, Latanyu in social sciences, Jesse Pena, congratulations, he's officially a CLT. We've known him for a long time, we're very happy that he's official now. Um, also jo Joseph Seiter in ET. I'd also like to uh, have you welcome John Triola, who's our new director of public safety. John. Thank you, John, ha John Hochberg, who's our athletic director, and uh, soon to be, in a few weeks, Belinda Delgado, who is going to be our Title IX officer. And I want to take this opportunity to say, a, to say a special thank you to Mary Jane Shaw, who really is amazing. <laughs> and she's done great work with all of us, and I think we've all felt uh, partners to her efforts. This has been, uh, I think, a very good semester, this, the fall semester. We've accomplished a lot. I'm very proud to say that 76 faculty filed for the PSC CUNY grants. This is almost, a, I think it is our record from uh, almost every department, which is wonderful. Uh, Professor Asser and Denise Ward were awarded a $1.3 million grant from America's Promise to support students in technology. Dr. Sharon Lal and colleagues coordinated our first and very successful undergraduate research day. And I think what was so very special, you know, we are, we've become too comfortable and used to the fact that our STEM faculty do a great deal of undergraduate research. But what I saw that day were posters from students in social sciences with their mentors and in English with their mentors. And I really hope that that's a contagion that goes throughout uh, our campus. It was really gratifying. Uh, some other things that were wonderful, we sent our women's volleyball team to the Nationals. They did very well, we're very proud of them. And in the speech and theater department, our students and faculty were awarded top honors in the play. This is the Kennedy Center Festival, which is a, region, a national festival, and in the region, which was held at Montclair State, the play and other which was created by uh, Julian Jimenez in collaboration with his student actors. Uh, they were uh, selected for first prize and they opened the festival and we were very pleased to see this incredible production which was in a thousand seat theater filled and the audience was so appreciative. As you know, <laughs> the, the speech the theater department, our theater program, received national accreditation, one of only eight in the entire country from community colleges, and the only certified uh, theater program in CUNY, period. So uh, again, it's a tribute, I think, to our faculty. And together with our students and our faculty, 
the food pantry opened this, this uh, fall. It was um, a wonderful effort, and I think it really came out of our community, and it, it really has been successful. I thank the people who've been involved, our student government, Dr. Tai, um, so many faculty. I don't want to leave people's names out, but they've been great, and I congratulate them. We've also uh, gotten word that we have at least 800 graduates this January. That's very, very good. We're pleased. It means our students are staying with us, completing, and going on, as you know, to great, great things. A um, couple of days ago, on a rainy day that Tuesday, it was not the best day for lots of reasons, but we got wonderful word that our NCLEX, that's the pass rate on the New York on the national nursing examination. Queensboro again for 2016 the year had the highest scores, the highest in CUNY senior or community colleges, and again higher than Columbia, NYU, Binghamton, etc. So congratulations to our nursing department. It's really really special. They work very hard all year long. And of course, the other thing that got accomplished somehow, uh, that got implemented, if you will, was were the contracts for 14 unions. They're all completed. Hopefully, you will find something in your uh, paycheck this week, and uh, well-deserved and long overdue. So I hope everything continues in a positive way on that line. This spring, we're going to continue, obviously, our strong support for faculty development with CETL and with so many peer leaders from our faculty. So I want to thank Vice President Palmer, Dean Landy, and the faculty leaders uh, who really do inspire all of us. This last year, over 314 faculty participated in high impact practices, and many, many more participated in larger, uh, broader workshops, ranging from all kinds of topics that are of importance to our faculty and our students. This spring, uh, the art department is um, in response to their request for a certification as a national program in art. We believe we will be awarded this year. I don't want to jinx it, but we're very, very close, and we look forward to hearing that very good news. Our dance department uh, is well on its way. We are working uh, again to prepare the final documents. And our music department also is seeking national certification. This is an incredible feat to have all four of the arts um, be so well recognized. And again, it's because of the faculty in those departments. This kind of work takes literally years, and they have been at it for a very long time, and I think they have, have really made all of us very proud, so we're looking forward to that. Also, our business department is, is up to their necks in their business reaccreditation. They've submitted their documents. Again, a long effort led by faculty, and our Department of Nursing is getting ready for its accreditation, reaccreditation, which I believe is next year they have to have all their documents in. And then we have our own middle state self-study. It's that time of the decade. Um, it seems like it never, <laughs> never stops. You'll hear a little bit more about it, and I, I think it's a great opportunity for faculty to offer service. You'll be invited to do so. It is important. And other opportunities include the many governance uh, committees, bodies, that will be holding election throughout the spring semester. And I hope you'll look into that and, and consider applying for all of these positions, because they really are important. In terms of uh, what's out there in the world, on Tuesday, that rainy day, I was up in Albany with Vice President Zins. We, were, um, go, we go up there at least once a year to meet with legislators. Uh, I, kind of phrase it, our speed dating. We meet uh, individually with individual <laughs> legislators. And we basically are advocating, obviously, on behalf of our institution. And we have a lot of data which demonstrates that the investment by the New York State Legislature and our governor is very well placed. Uh, we do very good work here. I think we pressed, obviously, for an increase in base aid, which is still below 2006 levels at this point for community colleges. We have advocated for maintenance of effort to ensure we can support the contractual obligations we have. And I think that our message to them was basically, you can hold us accountable, but you also should look at the outcomes, which are very strong. And so um, we were given a very good reception by our legislators. So I'm hopeful, hopeful, I'm cautious. 
I guess I'm old enough to be a little cynical, so we'll see. Uh, there are external factors. Both the state uh, and the city budgets are assuming federal aid. That's a huge part of the budgets for the New York State, New York City budgets. We're not quite sure uh, what's going to happen for a variety of reasons. And uh, certainly, in terms of the federal administration and the changes there, we are wondering, we're not sure, about education, immigration, human rights, and women are human too, so they're, they're superhuman, actually, but they're in that category. <laughs> but this uncertainty, it, it, I think the greatest concern is that respect for others be maintained and that folks don't act on this assumption that they can say and do whatever they please. And I think we'll be guarding very specially uh, across our campus and across our city and across our state to safeguard that respect. I know that we're going to keep our faith here. We are going to believe in people. That's why we're in this wonderful profession. And we're going to ensure that our values, the values that we've developed as a faculty, as an institution, are upheld. That's the strongest possible performance personally and academically for our students, certainly for ourselves as well. And we do have to find some hope. We do. There are alternative facts in what appears to be an alternative universe. Um, but, but you have to look. There are gleam, gleams, a little a bit of hope. Uh, I understand that Woody Johnson has been named the ambassador to England. What's the bright side? He might take the jets with him, which would be very good. <laughs> I am a Jets fan, but it's a little hard to say we're rebuilding since 1969. So, anyway, I really look forward uh, to today's program. It features our faculty speaking about several interesting and important topics. And, and I know that you'll join me in um, listening to them and learning from them, and we'll learn from one another today, especially in the breakout sessions. They're led by our faculty from the Faculty Diversity Committee, along with senior faculty and staff. And so I hope you will enjoy those as well. I want to thank um, Academic Affairs, Dr. Sandra Palmer, for organizing this. Joe Pantaleo, who's been an amazing uh, mentor to the Faculty Diversity Committee, and to all of you for being here this morning. Have a wonderful semester, and take care. Thank you so much, President Call. The theme for uh, this, the convocation this morning uh, is, uh, as, you can, well, as we saw a second ago, is opportunities and challenges. Uh, and of course, we all know that there are opportunities and challenges uh, as a faculty member at the college, at all colleges. There's always wonderful opportunities and there's also challenges. So what we thought we'd do in the first half of, the, uh, of, of this morning is talk about some of these opportunities and challenges, and then talk about the, the, uh, the work, the breakout sessions that Dr. Milton is going to uh, uh, introduce in, in a bit. Um, three opportunities, uh, two opportunities that, that we have going on right now. One. One are the workshops that will begin next week on uh, reappointment, promotion, tenure and promotion. And, and another opportunity for faculty are the presidential fellowship, is the pe presidential fellowship program that we, we offer for mid-career associate professors uh, and give them an opportunity to do at research give them release time to do research with the hopes that they will uh, come decide to uh, apply for promotion to full professor. One of the challenges, and I guess it's an opportunity too, be, the, the, the middle states, I mean, you're going to hear middle states from now, you've already heard it, from this point today for the next two years, middle states, middle states, mid, middle states. Um, the, it's a challenge because we have to do a lot of work in a fairly short period of time 
uh, to write our self-study. That's a major challenge for any inst academic institution, but it's an opportunity for faculty to participate. So we thought that the, the theme for today would be opportunities and challenges, and I just want to briefly touch on some of these, and then we'll get to the meat of our morning uh, with the breakout sessions. The, the uh, workshops that we have planned for this semester are not new. They've been offered before at the college. Uh, but, we, but as we begin to uh, offer them, we're, we fine tune them and fine tune them. And I think uh, what we have for this semester um, is, are, are wonderful workshops, excellent topics presented by excellent individuals all of whom have gone through the various processes, all of whom have personal experience, and all of whom are, they're your, you know, they're your colleagues who really want to help and, and uh, work with you and to make you successful in your journey at the institution. So just very briefly, I want to uh, introduce once again the, 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 the workshops, and I hope you really consider uh, attending one or more of these workshops. Um, uh, they're, they're extremely helpful. Uh, they'll answer a lot of your questions. And of course, you know, the idea of reappointment, tenure, and promotion is something that we think about all the time. Uh, and the, this is an opportunity to really uh, uh, help you, in, as I said, in your journey. So the first workshop uh, starts actually next week, February 6th, and that's what we call what you need to know when applying to the rank of professor. Um, that's a major step in any, in any faculty member's academic career. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's an excellent workshop. We offered it last year. People who attended said that they got a lot out of it. It was very helpful. So I hope that those of you who are in this category of thinking about applying to the rank of professor. Consider attending the workshop. It's Monday, February 6th from 2 to 3.30 in the Oakland Dining Room. The, the next workshop that we are going to offer is going to be offered on Wednesday, February 15th from 2 to 3.30 in o the Oakland Dining Room. And that's uh, what we titled Promotion and Tenure for Mid-Career fa Faculty. So those of you who are in that that category who are thinking about uh, of, of applying or moving toward promotion to the rank of professor uh, should take the opportunity should take this opportunity and, and attend this workshop. Um, the presenters are seasoned folks here at the college, and their knowledge, their experience, their words of wisdom will be extremely extremely helpful. The third workshop will be on February 27th from noon to 1.30 in Oakland, and that's a general information session on reappointment and tenure processes for assistant professors. So our new faculty, and we have many of these wonderful new people who have joined us, I have a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of questions about tenure, about moving on to promotion to associate, et cetera. And again, this workshop uh, will be extremely helpful. The presenters are, again, seasoned folks who have been through the process, and they can really help, uh, help answer any question you have and really guide you through the process. We always talk about how can we, you know, service to the college, um, you know, uh, committees, both at the college level at key, and the university level. So we have a, uh, a workshop which will be on Monday, March 6th from 2 to 3.30 in Oakland on opportunities for service to the college and opportunities and programs at QCC and CUNY for professional development. Our presenters will be uh, Dr. David Humphreys, who will be representing uh, the, the faculty executive committee, and Dr. Peter Bales, who will be representing the uh, academic senate. And again, they'll share with you all of the different possibilities, department level, college level, uh, CUNY level, possibilities for service to the institution as part of that promotion package, um, as we all know about. Um, uh, the three-legged, now it's extended to maybe a four-legged 
of the stool, um, teaching service, uh, research, and always very important is collegiality. Finally, and this is the one that I think is just so wonderful. Finally, practice sessions for presenting before the faculty, personnel, and budget committee for full professor. Um, this was last year was my first experience going through this process, uh, and it's as you know, faculty who come up for full for professor to the rank of professor. Um, choose to do so on their own, and they present themselves to the committee. So when they present themselves to the committee, they are basically standing in front of this group of uh, people uh, in the president's conference room, and they're really talking about basically why they feel they deserve to be promoted to the rank of professor. Um, what, we, what we offered, and we offered this last year and I believe the year before, are practice sessions for these individuals who, want, who decide to come up for the rank of professor, uh, where they actually do their presentation, they have their own colleagues there to help them, give them input, tell them you're talking too fast, tell them you're talking too slow, tell them you need to look up at the audience, um, really giving them helpful hints in their presentation because the presentation is very important um, uh, in that in the uh, in the process. So right now we have scheduled two practice sessions: Thursday, March second, and Thursday, March sixteenth. Um, and if we need to, we'll open up another one or two more practice sessions to accommodate uh, everybody. Uh, who, you don't have to do that, but my recommendation is you go through that process because it'll be extremely helpful. The, the folks who did it last year did a wonderful job when they finally came up and presented, presented themselves to the, uh, the, the faculty personnel and budget committee. Um, I was very proud of them, uh, and they, they, were, they were very successful. So those are the workshops. Please take, whether you're a new faculty, mid-career faculty, about to come up for tenure, thinking about applying for full pro for professor, think of, take the, seize the moment, and, and if you can, um, attend, come to these, to come, attend one or two or three, or whatever you can, workshops. I think you'll enjoy them. Um, the second, challenge opportunity is, of course, middle states. Um, and like I said, you're going to hear about middle states from now for the next two years, middle states, middle states, middle states, middle states. Um, what we have, uh, what we've asked, we have now two middle state self-study executive co-chairs, all right, two middle state self-study executive co-chairs who will be working with Dr. Cordetti um, as well as the working groups and the, those on the working groups um, in, this pro next, in, the, in this process. Um, our, our executive co-chairs, and I'm delighted to introduce them to you, are Dr. Antonella Ansani and Professor Kelly Ford. Um, they are, they're just getting started. They started working with Dr. Corradetti, um, and I've asked them to uh, come up and just say a brief couple words um, to you about the process, about their role, um, and really they're kicking off the, 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 the process really kicks off this spring, uh, and they're today kicking it off for you. So ladies, come on up. Thank you. I'm honored to be able to speak to you today about the Middle States Project. I've been asked to give a brief overview of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education Self-Study Report, which many of you know is the process by which we gain reaccreditation. Dr. Antonella Asani will then go through the timeline for completion of the report. The regional accreditation and peer review process is a means of self-regulation that has evolved to support the goals of strengthening and sustaining higher education and making it worthy of public confidence. Um, 
There are two purposes. First is the advancement of self-understanding and self-improvement. The second purpose is for Queensboro to demonstrate how we meet the standards for accreditation and requirements for affiliation to external audiences, including the Middle States Commission, governmental regulatory agencies, and the public at large. There are seven standards of accreditation and 15 requirements for affiliation. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through each of them today. I do, however, want to stress one point. The biggest misconception is that the commission imposes standards on us, when in fact we demonstrate how we meet our own standards to them. We have a mission, we have a strategic plan, we have bylaws that we created and uphold policies and procedures that we set for ourselves. The commission will never say, why do you have this mission? They will say, how do you meet your mission? I'm privileged to serve the college in this capacity and have the unique opportunity to work with and learn from Dr. Arthur Corradetti and his vast experience in the accreditation area. This is a collaborative effort and the input of all faculty members and the administration is crucial to a successful outcome. I look forward to working with all of you to demonstrate all of the excellent work that we do here at Queensboro. And now it is with great pleasure right, that I turn this over to the executive co-chair of the Middle States Project and professor of the Foreign Languages and Literatures Department, Dr. Antonella Asani. Thank you. Kelly said it all, I could go home. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to present, and I'm going to put this um, on the screen, is the timeline for the complete process. So the process, as you can see, begins this semester, spring 2017, and will end in the spring 2019. And uh, it will end with the decision of accreditation, which we all hope is going to be, we're sure it's going to be positive. Uh, so let's see what happens uh, this semester. Uh, in the spring 2017, uh, 2017 is going to be an organizational process. So uh, the uh, self-study design draft will be drafted and will be prepared. And the, very soon, in February, we will send out a call for volunteers. You have heard from different people this morning that we really, really need you. Uh, so we really hope that you are going to volunteer to participate. We cannot do it without you. And uh, it's going to be also a great opportunity for you both to uh, have service, you know, give, provide service for the college and also to learn a lot about the institution. Uh, the institution is so rich and there's so many things going on, it's impossible for people who are not involved in the day-to-day -day work to learn about it, and so this is gonna be a great opportunity. You will uh, be amazed how many things the college does. So we really hope that you're going to uh, volunteer to participate. And uh, when, once we have the volunteers, we're going to establish the working groups. And uh, there are going to be seven working groups, one, each for, one for each um, uh, standards. Um, once we have the groups formed, we're going to have an orientation where we explain what your responsibilities are going to be, what the responsibility of the working groups are going to be, and how the work is going to uh, proceed, and of course the, the uh, self-study design will be our guide. And in May, the uh, liaisons from the Middle State will come to campus, we'll look 
at our uh, draft. We'll give feedback. We will rework it following the feedback until we have a um, uh, you know stable document that we can use to work. And um, so this is what's going to happen in the spring. The bulk of the work of the working groups is going to be done in the academic year 2017-2018, fall and spring. Uh, this is when the working groups will really, really uh, do their work. Uh, they will review uh, the documents and data uh, that is aligned to the standards for accreditation, and they will conduct campus interview to find out whatever information they need to have in order to write their report or chapter. Each group will have a report and a, uh, will write a um, report or chapter, and uh, the groups will be asked to write several drafts so that we can sort of see how the work is proceeding and make corrections if correction need to be made. And uh, we will provide feedback uh, together with the steering committee and the um, working group will be able to edit their chapters. Uh, the chapters are due at the end of spring 2018, so the work will occur throughout the academic year. And by that time, the um, chair of the team that will come to campus will be announced and we will know who the, the team uh, is going to be the, um, and the chair and who the chair is going to be. During the summer of 2018, the executive co-chairs uh, will work and review all the chapters written by the working groups and uh, they will consult with the steering committee and they, we will prepare a um, final document. And this document will be distributed, the information containing this document and the document will be distributed in the fall 2018 to the campus and everybody is going to be able to give feedback and suggestion for revision of the report. And uh, the, during the fall of 2018, the, um, uh, the, the chair of the uh, Middle State Evaluation team will come to campus, will look at the document again, give us feedback, so that we will be able to have a final revision. As you can see, we're talking about many, many, many revisions. And um, this, uh, the final revision of the self-study report, it will be due uh, in January, spring 2019, and at that point, the campus work will really be finished. And what will happen is that later on in the semester, the Middle State teams will visit the campus that will be here for several days, I don't remember how many days, exact four days, and they will go over all the material, all the documents, the, um, the, um, the report, and by the end, by June, they should come up with an evaluation and accreditation. So as you can see, we're talking about five semesters of hard work. And again, we need you, and we hope that you're going to volunteer as soon as we, um, we uh, send out the call for volunteers. Thank you very much, and we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I have to say that, you know, you know, Antonella said it's five semesters worth of a lot of work. It is five semesters, wor uh, wor five semesters of a lot of work. Um, but serving on a cell and one of these working groups is, is a wonderful experience. You know, we talk about opportunities for faculty. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn about the college, um, to be involved in something that is, is very, very, very important and meaningful, um, and to just be working with your colleagues, meeting new, meeting new people. I mean, there's 404 or something, or I don't know, maybe more now, new faculty. Um, and 
uh, not, no, we don't know everybody, that's for sure. This is a big, big institution, but it's a, just a wonderful way to, to meet your colleagues and get to know them and maybe down the road collaborate with them on, on some project or whatever. So it's, it's I, you know, Antonella stressed, think about these work, working, you know, getting involved in the working groups, and I, and I have to echo that. Um, it's a wonderful experience, um, and it's service to the college. When we talk about opportunities for service to the college, that's major. It's major. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Whoop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jesse, how do I get this back on? <laughs> I'm in it. Yeah, yeah, because I had one other PowerPoint. One. I got it. Another opportunity for uh, faculty um, is, is uh, the Presidential Fellowship Program. And uh, right now we have five faculty uh, who are Presidential Fellowship Program uh, grantees and individuals who are working on their research. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with this program, which I have to say is a wonderful, I mean, to, you know, to, we support faculty at this institution in, in a way that I've never seen before. This is my fourth institution in, in my academic career, and the support that we give faculty is astounding. It's wonderful, and this is one of these opportunities, again, for faculty, mid-career faculty, but it's intended to provide support for mid-career faculty who require additional resources to engage in scholarly activities to enhance their opportunity for promotion. The goal of this program is to encourage mid-career faculty who are working to develop a strong record of scholarly activity for promotion to the next rank. So again, I encourage, we will have hopefully another round of this. Um, uh, and uh, I hope those of you who are in this category take, take this opportunity to work toward that next level. It is my pleasure to introduce two of our Presidential Fellowship Program uh, awardees um, who are going to talk about their research up to this point. Uh, so you have an idea of what they're doing and, uh, and their work. Um, and I thought it would be, and again, this is just another, another instance of uh, opportunities for faculty uh, at the college. So first let me introduce Professor Janice Malloy from the nursing department. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? I am uh, Janice Malloy from the nursing department. I'm an associate professor, and I am one of the awardees. I would like to tell you uh, about the program, the pilot that ran this past fall 16 semester. A senior capstone program is an end of program clinical immersion for soon to be graduated seniors. Baccalaureate nursing programs have offered these experiences for approximately two decades. However, the literature reveals that they are rarely offered in associate degree programs. Nursing students all take the same licensing examination, whether they are enrolled in an associate degree program or a baccalaureate program. The intent of this pilot was to provide two senior nursing students a transition into practice to directly manage patients under the supervision of a nurse preceptor in a local clinical facility. The experience was to increase critical thinking skills, time management, comfort with the responsibility of organizing care for multiple patients. Capstone experiences are activities that seniors commonly face prior to their graduation. Many events needed to take place to put this pilot into, into gear. The process began with seeking permission from the director of nursing education at a local hospital. Once in place, a medical surgical unit was selected, and I established a working relationship and understanding of the project with the nurse manager on the unit. Recruiting the preceptors, this was the easiest step. 
Our reputation in the local clinical facilities is well known, and preceptors eagerly were, were receptive to be precepting our senior students. They have seen the caliber of QCC students, and they readily agreed to take them on. The students were chosen. They followed the preceptor's schedule, which included three 12-hour shifts weekly, including holidays and weekends. Recruitment of the students. 11 of our 38 senior students expressed interest in this pilot. Criteria for interview included a GPA of 3.0, excellent clinical evaluations, and enrollment in one of QCC's three dual joint programs, Hunter, York, or our School of Professional Studies, which is a fully online program. The students were interviewed by myself and the coordinator of the senior semester using a rubric that was developed for the pilot. Once the students were chosen, a contract was signed outlining their responsibilities and reviewing their learning outcomes. Next, they had to pass a pharmacology and clinical calculation exam at the clinical facility. If they were not successful, they were not admitted. Thank goodness our two students were. Um, that a meeting was set up with each student and the preceptor prior to them rotating. The meeting also included the nurse manager of the unit who gave the students their rotation schedule. As the students began the rotation, I visited them twice weekly to evaluate their learning experience. I maintained close contact with the student and the preceptor as well. The visits provided insight into what the students were learning and how the students were feeling during this experience. This helped problem solving and concerns that needed strengthening and clarification. For every precepted shift work, the students were asked to reflect in writing on their experiences of the day and any challenges, which they met, were discussed. Weekly attendance logs were signed by the preceptor and submitted to me. Preceptors provided feedback that was officially evaluated at midpoint and the conclusion of the program and they were willing to provide constructive feedback that further enhanced our students' learning. The relationship between the preceptor and the students quickly flourished. Both students felt that the preceptors were very knowledgeable, open to questions, and provided opportunities to enhance their skills and learning. They guided the students to function independently, and the students quickly rose to the occasion. It was really beautiful to see. One preceptor told me that her student was better than experienced nurses on orientation. As the weeks went by, the two students felt like staff members. They participated in quality improvement initiatives on the nursing unit, spent a shift rotating with the charge nurse, and attended in-hospital seminars when available. The QCC students were models of experimental learning as they could apply theory into practice quickly. They were truly career ready by the end of the rotation and were proud of their accomplishments. The two preceptors told me that they were equal, if not better, than the baccalaureate students who do the same clinical rotation. The continued reputation of our students speaks for itself. The difference is our students were enrolled in this pilot as well as being enrolled in a nine credit end of semester nursing class. They were responsible for missed lectures. They were responsible for examinations. They were responsible for writing assignments. Baccalaureate students in this program do not have any of those responsibilities. The pilot concluded with a breakfast at the clinical site with the director of nursing education, the nurse manager, the preceptors, and the chairperson of our nursing department. The students presented their final research project, which they developed during their rotation. The students had the following topics to choose from, safety, ethics, patient-centered care, leadership, or healthcare policy, according to QSIN, which is Quality and Safety Education for Nurses. One student created a teaching tool for medication safety, and the second provided additional evidence to an existing policy on seizure precautions as a quality management initiative, which was put into the hospital's policy and procedure. This supportive pilot will decrease stressors and challenges experienced by the new graduate when they transition into clinical practice. 
The students stated that they now have a better understanding of organizing the workday, new procedures and situations, and dealing with the healthcare team in general. They felt the transition into professional practice gave them a huge sense of accomplishment and competence and felt better prepared for the next step in their nursing career, which will be orientation to their first professional nursing position. I will conclude this with student responses that were noted on their exit survey, of course, with the student's permission. First response. On my last day, I felt a little sad because the program was ending. I had become attached to the staff on the unit from the housekeeper to the team of physicians. These people have become part of my life who I shared experiences with and who laughed with me. The program greatly boosted my confidence and exposed me to real-time nursing. Second and last response by the student, compassion and empathy are essential in providing patient-centered care. However, too much emotion can cause a burden on the nurse as well. I had a patient today in acute respiratory distress who wanted to see her daughter as she thought she was going to die. She asked the palliative care team, am I dying? I felt helpless as they transferred to her to the medical ICU. She said thank you to me over and over. It was more like goodbye. I cried when she left our unit. I felt the burden of her emotions, and this was a new experience for me. However, even after the reality, I feel that I will never regret choosing nursing as my career, and this is the most valuable lesson that I learned. This pilot will be repeated in the fall of this year, 2017 semester, as it provides tremendous advantage to our students upon graduation. This may increase hiring of the associate degree student prior to completing their baccalaureate degree. The clinical facility is now considering our two capstone students on a part-time basis as they continue on for their baccalaureate degree. This is huge for our students. To be continued, thank you. Wow, that is really interesting. Janice, by the way, she said she was in the second cohort of Presidential Fellowship Program awardees. Um, so she, her 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 research is 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 fairly new, and the progress that you you've made, and what you just said with the students and their comments is just outstanding. So congratulations on that. Um, Professor Hamid Namdar from the engineering department is, was in the, is in the first cohort of Presidential Fellowship Program awardees. So I'd like to introduce him to talk about his research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hamid Namdar from uh, engineering technology department. Uh, my research, uh, you know, when I choose this Queensborough uh, CUNY Presidential Fellowship Program, uh, I'd like to tell you my experience about this uh, fellowship. You know, I received this fellowship about uh, two semesters ago, and uh, my experience with the uh, technology student at QCC was that uh, there's a course called Control Systems, which this, this course kind of puts together every other course the students take, like the electrical networking one, uh, programming, and all that. Then this course is the last course they take before they move on, either to their bachelor degree or, uh, or, or go to the uh, uh, workforce. So I found out that I couldn't find a book, that a good book, that uh, kind of relates all this stuff they learned in the previous courses for technology students. So I said, I said let me use this opportunity, see if I could come up with a book, you know, write a book that our technology students could use. Most control system engineering course are written for engineers. And they have a lot of mathematics that our technology students kind of couldn't understand or can't understand, so I have to redefine those. So I said, let me try to work this out into a book. So what I did uh, two semesters ago when I took this course, uh, you know, this uh, fellowship is renewable for four semesters. So you get uh, four hours of release time. I just want to explain my experience to you. Okay, this fellowship uh, program provides me a support to engage in a scholarly activity to work on textbook for technology students. 
and also for promotion. You know, it's a good thing to, for uh, our younger faculty who, who are just starting, it's a good way to start for, uh, you know, to do some publication. So I chose the control system technology uh, textbook. My goal for this fellowship program was to research and publish a control system theory textbook and for the technology students. The aim is to simplify the topics of this book using realistic systems and examples. So what I did in the first semester of this research, I collected materials for the books. I mean, I went all over looking at other books, looking on the internet, collect a lot of information. So I find out that this process is very time consuming. You know, you gotta look through all these books, take what you need and try to collect them. So, so I have collected a lot of uh, materials and I've been kind of studying them and I begin to compose the chapters in these semesters. In the first semesters, uh, in the first chapter I covered the definition and examples of control systems. Things like open loop, closed loop system, with many illustration. In the second chapter, I covered electrical circuits and various components used to control systems like um, sensors, motors, amplifiers. These are components that we use for, let's say, systems like robotics, uh, electrical cars, things like that. So in the third chapters, I kind of, uh, it consists of mathematics uh, kind of used in understanding control system. So I'm trying to simplify the math in control system. Hopefully I could achieve that. And you know, one, one challenge I encounter working on this assignment is basically creating and producing illustrations, examples for this book. So I started using uh, something called the micro, Microsoft Visio, which I'm doing all the diagrams, creating uh, examples and things like that. So I hope, uh, you know, by, they, but in the next year, I kind of finish this book and I encourage you to apply for this fellowship. It's a good program. It gives you four hours of release time. It gives you a good opportunity to produce something, to pu public something. Uh, you know, before that, I, you know, as you know, we all faculty, we have a lot of things to do. So it's very hard to work on something. So this gave me a good opportunity to do that. Thank you. very much. Thank you. So now to the meat and potatoes of today's, thank you both of you very much. Uh, uh, the the so-called so meat and potatoes of today's uh, uh, activity. Um, and, and that's, and, and, we, and, and, that, and, and again, it continues this theme of opportunities and challenges for faculty, particularly in this case, challenges. So we titled this, uh, the, this, this, this part of the uh, activity today. How do I handle that? Classroom and campus challenges for faculty. Uh, and we, when we talked about uh, the different topics, and I'm, I will, I'm certainly not gonna stand up here and do it, I'm gonna introduce Trevor Milton in two seconds. Um, we came up with uh, four topics that we think uh, that we know are challenges for faculty in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Uh, and I think, I, I think these are excellent and I hope you uh, attend these breakout sessions. Uh, Trevor will describe them in more detail. He will describe the process of breaking out into these different groups. Um, and I hope you take advantage of this because it'll be very informative, very, very helpful for you. And again, collaboration with your colleagues on topics of, of this nature uh, uh, will be very meaningful, I think. So let me introduce Dr. Milton, please. Trevor. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, first, oh, I guess I could use this. So I'm, I'm here to introduce the, the breakout sessions for today. And this was 
uh, put together by the diversity committee. And um, just to begin, I wanted to think a little, like myself and other members of the committee have been thinking a lot about this, this term, uh, diversity. And for some reason, is this connected? I just wanted to. I just wanted to show the breakout sessions on the on the screen. Is this? Am I plugging into the right thing? Got it right here. Oh, it's here. Okay. I could do it just like that. Huh? Very good. So I'm sorry. I'm bringing this up as I'm talking. So um, the word diversity, in and of itself, um, I think generally speaking, people tend to think of only one thing, and that's that's either race, ethnicity. Sometimes people think of gender. Uh, and I just started to kind of look around and, um, is that visible? Uh, I don't know, kick the tires on this word diversity. And I was looking at like a, a Webster's uh, definition for it, uh, which Webster's defined it as the condition of having or being composed of different elements. It doesn't really say much of, much of anything. Uh, but the idea is that it's, it's about uh, those differences, uh, QCC, uh, has actually an entire section of its of its website dedicated to the concept of diversity, you know, mentioning mentioning the committee, mentioning its its commitments to diversity, and um, I just really wanted to emphasize the idea of like diversity is not just about ethnicity and race, it's not just about gender, and for that matter, it's not just about uh, non-white or non-male, non-heterosexual. Um, Diversity is supposed to include everything, all these things. And included in that are, you know, diversity of thought, uh, diversity of values, diversity of religion, um, and the issues that we have to deal with uh, on a regular basis here on this college campus. And so uh, the committee put together these breakout sessions, which, uh, just like Sandra said, um, we, we hope you attend. I highly encourage you to attend uh, because uh, Probably each person in this room has had to deal with one of these uh, four issues that are mentioned here. Uh, so there are four breakout sessions that begin immediately after I finish talking. Uh, I know they were supposed to get it to begin at 10.30, but we get to start a little bit early. Uh, and just to give an idea of what each of these things are about. So basically, we have one breakout session about um, a little bit Still not getting. Um, we, have, we have one breakout session about uh, Title IX, um, another about student behavior, uh, a third about unconscious bias, and a third about students with disabilities. And just to say a little bit about each of these things, um, first of all, Title IX, which maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you've heard like, okay, yes, I'm, I've heard of Title IX before, but I have no clue what that means. <laughs> I keep hearing it coming up. Uh, in meetings and, and in sessions, et cetera. Um, Title IX in education was originally built off of the Education Amendments Act of 1972, uh, which was a federal law that states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Um, Essentially, that law was designed so that there is equity in education between men and women, uh, so that both uh, or, or people of any or orientation uh, can be free of discrimination. And um, more in recent years, this has evolved uh, to, or has grown to include basically the benefits of safety, the benefits of feeling safe on a college campus. Um, and not being subject to harassment on a regular basis, or, or basically harassment as a form of discrimination. Uh, and so this is one breakout session where, um, and again, we are here to kind of help answer a lot of the questions that faculty may have. Uh, this is actually making me think about um, probably about two or three weeks ago, this was, I, forgive me, I can't name the state or the town where this took place, but in a, in a high school, uh, this male uh, high school teacher was, uh, I guess you could say, a little bit disturbed by how one of his female students were dressed. And so his way of taking, his way of handling that uh, was to suggest that she dress more conservatively. Uh, and what was missing from that, or what was, what was kind of a, the problem with that uh, was that he just didn't, he didn't have the new language for it, he didn't understand where students were coming from, uh, and 
professors, generally speaking, need to know more about um, harassment on campus, in particular something that me personally, I think that I don't know how we still have this in our culture. Uh, I feel like we should have nipped this in the bud a generation ago, but sexual assault on college campuses is something that's still occurring at the same rates as it was a generation ago. It's, it's just amazing that this is still a problem. Uh, and this is something that um, we hope to you know, give professors more information about uh, in order to be able to see these things, in order to create a safer environment for students, uh, and so students can have a, an environment where they are more safe from, um, from this type of harassment and or discrimination and where students essentially are being denied the benefits of a safe environment for college education. Uh, and so that is one breakout session that will be an M134. And in fact, all the breakout sessions are immediately outside this door. So if you, so if you walk past them, Shame, no, I'm kidding, I was gonna say shame on you. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, so, so it's, it's not like you have to walk far to get to any of these sessions. Uh, and so the, this will be, uh, that particular session will be run by um, William Fletcher Anthony and Wendy Ford. Those are the diversity uh, committee members. Uh, Joe Culkin will be the senior faculty uh, who will be there. And Mary Jane, Shaw, who, Mary Jane Shaw, who is the Title IX coordinator, will also be there to answer questions. This is an opportunity to ask those questions that you've always wanted to ask, uh, but then also to be engaged in the workshops that we have planned in each of, each of these sessions. But please take advantage, because this is, you may have had curiosities about how these things work for years. Now is the time to ask these questions. Now is the time for you uh, to address these curiosities that you've had. Uh, and again, this is, this is the purpose of diversity, diversity of thought, uh, and um, learning more. Uh, the second section is about student behavior. Uh, and concerns about student behavior can come in many different forms. Uh, whether that is students that are just distracting to students that are disruptive, um, there's always a concern about violent behavior in classrooms. Um, well, we're really going on 11 years now being removed from um, the single shooter event at, at Virginia Tech. I, I just remember, I'm sure the majority of you in this room have probably been teaching since 2006. Um, it seems that every school had a response to the potential of, and I think the technical term is active shooter event. Um, I don't, it's not what this is all about, but this is something that uh, some professors may be concerned about. Um, every school had a response, whether that was to um, make sure your doors are locked uh, as you're teaching in course, uh, whether that is to um, try to spot students who may be emotionally disturbed early. Uh, I remember I remember a memo passing through the CUNY system that was uh, suggested that professors do just that. Um, and then of course there are other you know schools around the country which talked about arming professors with guns. <laughs> I don't think that was a brilliant idea. Uh, but um, but that's, that's what happens when you don't have information. That's what happens when these things are not discussed. So again, it's not just about violent students. It's not just about, um, I don't know, students who fall asleep in class, maybe. <laughs> but um, just know that the campus does have resources for all of these things, whether that is public safety, calling public safety. We'll be talking about that in that breakout session. Um, we also have a counseling department in the library for students who may need counseling services. Um, and then of course, it's, it's interesting because like on the, on the webpage for all of these issues, um, you know, QCC suggests that faculty members who have concerns about classroom management and behavior issues should consult with their department chairpersons because your chairpersons apparently have all the answers. I don't know if that's actually true. I actually encourage the chairpersons to attend these sessions as well uh, because this is, um, th again, you probably have had questions about these for years, and now is your opportunity to ask and to discuss and to go through these, the workshops that we have planned for each of these things. Um, third on this list is about unconscious bias. Um, this is probably one of the most important and, and most relevant to the diversity committee because um, we assume that we are free of bias because we're educated, um, because we're college professors, but the reality is that we all uh, experience and or express some sort of unconscious bias. 
And because we have such a diverse student body, and again, diverse in ethnicity, diverse in race, diverse in sexual orientation, diverse in religion, diverse in thought, diverse in values, and diverse in political orientation, um, we have to learn how to juggle all of these different types of diversities in our, in our classrooms. So again, I highly encourage you uh, to, to attend, you know, pick whichever session you feel you have, basically which you are most anxious to learn about and go. Um, and the last on this list is about students with disabilities uh, and accommodating or, or reasonable accommodations uh, for, for students with disabilities. Um, and whether that is an official diagnosis or unofficial, um, there are a lot of students with special needs. There are a lot of students that need extra time. There are a lot of students that, again, uh, may or may not need counseling services. So that breakout session is going to um, address the services that are available here at, at the school, at, at the college, and um, also to uh, do another breakout session. You know, And each of these breakout sessions has a, a workshop style format uh, where we deal with um, you know, particular scenarios, you look at different scenarios, you try to define the problem, you try to identify uh, individuals that may be causing the problem, causing the tension, or causing the challenge in each of these issues. Um, and then the idea of the workshop is to develop uh, strategies and solutions for each of these things. Again, um, to say that everybody in this room has likely had a difficult student or difficult students throughout their tenure, um, probably goes without saying. And you might have felt frozen in those moments. You might have felt like, I have no idea what to do unless I explode or say something offensive. Uh, and so that is, that is the purpose of these breakout sessions. I highly encourage everybody to attend. I'm putting them up here so you guys can see uh, which ones. What's that? Oh, is that what you guys are saying? <laughs> I thought you guys would tell me to talk longer. I'm like, don't encourage me. Don't, don't, uh, <laughs> don't tempt me. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, one more time. Um, first session about Title IX, which again is about creating a safe environment uh, free of sexual harassment uh, here at the campus. Again, if you have any curiosities about that, uh, if you've had any unanswered questions that you feel that you've had for years, please um, attend that session. Second session about student behavior and the various types of student behavior, basically from um, disruptive behaviors, distracting, um, and other things that could be addressed here that are addressed on the QCC webpage are things like technology. Everybody in this room probably has their own policy on technology in the classroom. Some of you may be like me and have just, you've given up. And <laughs> just like resign, like, this, that's just it. Um, and even down to, I'm going to give it like a very particular example, um, even something like, I just became aware of the school's policy on um, medical withdrawals from classes. I didn't know about this until um, about a month ago, really. Uh, so there are, professors have options uh, for students who come with stories. I, I, um, I joke that I have, every semester I usually have probably three or four students that show up the first day and then disappear and then show up for the midterm and then disappear and then show up for the final exam and they're like, what do you mean I'm not gonna pass? Uh, and uh, you know, so I'm, I've, I've written it into my syllabi this semester that like you should withdraw early, this is the withdrawal period, or if something catastrophic happens in your life, there is a medical withdrawal uh, that the, the school will allow. Obviously you have to uh, have some sort of documentation to support that. Uh, again, third session on unconscious bias um, and what the biases that both students have and professors have. This is a great workshop to deal uh, with things that you, again, might not be aware of, unconscious. Uh, and then fourth session um, about students with disabilities, um, the accommodations that are available to them, uh, and also you making your students aware of these accommodations as well. I think there are quite a few students who go throughout an entire semester without realizing the accommodations that are available to them. Uh, and so um, feel free to attend. You can't attend all, I guess. That, that wouldn't be possible. But please, uh, I encourage all of you to attend at least one of these. Um, and so that's, that's about it. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else. Um, Thank you, Randy, to say.
Should I leave this up? I'll take my. I'll take this. Okay. And I'll leave that up. Just one quick thing, everybody. <laughs> We're going to break out into our sessions. Um, you know, take a take five or so minutes to get to your session. Um, please don't disappear. Take advantage of this opportunity. And thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful semester. Thank you.